Now we're going to talk about hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is a real fancy way of saying how a researcher or a manager will scientifically or statistically prove something to be true or not. Now, some questions we might ask are, is one marketing campaign better than another? Is average revenue of a group of customers greater than another group of customers? Are my customer satisfaction scores better than last year? Is one hospital more efficient than another hospital of similar size? In practice, this is similar to an A-B test, which compares, for example, one feature on a website versus another feature, although there are different methods used. In addition, these types of tests are performed in the medical field when testing new drugs. Normally, there is a control, people who didn't have the drug but had a placebo, against a group given a new medication. Now, it's important to note that you can look at averages and say, oh, well, I did better this year over last year. But what we're trying to really determine is whether or not those averages are statistically different from each other or whether it was just a slightly random chance that you were slightly above or slightly below the value that you're comparing to. The questions on the previous slide, though, represent the question of interest. These are known as the research hypothesis. And we're also going to consider that the alternative hypothesis or alternate hypothesis. This alternative hypothesis is challenging some accepted belief or a current state. Thus, the opposite of an alternate, alternate hypothesis is called a null hypothesis or the current accepted belief. The null hypothesis is denoted as an H0. It's the currently held belief, and we might call that uh, H0, H0. You might hear different terms for that. The alternative hypothesis is denoted as HA, and it is the question of interest to be proved. The null and alternative hypothesis create two sets, only one of which will be likely true. Now, the term likely is used since the analysis is based on a probability. It will be shown later why we're using the term likely. But if it's easier for the student right now, simply just consider one as being correct and the other as not being correct. But we will change that a little bit later. Assume a marketing department is examining if the daily number of customers coming into a store per day is 200 and it has collected data for the last six months, about 180 days of observations. The belief is that the daily customers is 200. So this is going to be the null hypothesis. The test will be to see if the sample we have is not 200 customers as an average, and this will be considered the alternative hypothesis. So we set this up. H0 is the number of customers equals 200, and HA is the number of customers is not 200. In the mathematical notation, we're going to use this as H0 is X bar equals 200, and HA is X bar is not equal to 200. Please note that the null hypothesis will always have an equal sign. And the alternative hypothesis will never have an equal sign. And that includes when we're doing greater than or less than equals. So if we're saying greater than or equal to, that's going to be in the null hypothesis. If we're saying equal to, that's going to be in the null hypothesis and so forth. Now, the tests that we do do not always have to be equal or not equal. For example, the same marketing department may wish to test if the average customers are less than or equal to 200. In this case, the goal was to see if the sample mean is equal to or not equal to 200. Previously, it was noted that the confidence interval around the sample gave an equidistant range above and below the sample mean in which the population might be found. The 200 in the example represents the existing belief and thus, the question asks, does the population mean fall in the confidence interval around the sample mean or not? So graphically, it looks like this. We have a sample mean of 204. If the population mean of 200 falls outside of the sample mean confidence interval, for example, at points 1 or 2, then the sample mean is not statistically equal to the population mean. If it falls inside the red area, which is the confidence interval, for example, 0.3, then statistically the sample mean is equal to the population mean. And don't get too confused about the fact that it was 200 or 204. The point here is that if your population mean falls, or the thing that you're looking to compare falls inside of that confidence interval, then it will be statistically equivalent. And if it falls outside, it won't be. And this is what we're looking for whether it's one tail or two tailed. 
This example is known as a two-tail test here, since the objective is to see if the population mean falls inside the interval. That is, that the sample mean is statistically equal to the population mean. If the population mean falls inside this interval, the sample came from that population, and there is no difference between the sample and the entire population. If, however, the population mean is not in this interval, then the sample must have come from a different population, or it means it came, did something different or was different in some way. Now, remember, the use of the term statistically equal is due to the fact that the sample mean will almost never be exactly the same as the population mean. Further, if the population mean falls in this interval, or is statistically equivalent, then the sample must have come from the same population. That is, the sample is not different than that overall population. In a one-tailed test, the objective is to see if the population mean falls on one side of the sample's confidence intervals. From the example below, the goal may be to find if the population mean is less than the sample mean. Therefore, since only one side of the boundary is being examined, this would be a one-tailed test. The test can be one-tailed on either side, so if we have a less than or greater than sign in our hypothesis test, it will be a one-tailed test. So as we said, the test does not always have to be equal or not equal. The same marketing department may wish to test if the average customer number of customers is less than or equal to 200. In this case, our focus is only on one side of the mean. The test would be if the sample mean is less than 200, meaning the current belief is that the mean is greater than or equal to 200. So the number of customers greater than or equal to 200 is our null hypothesis denoted mathematically as x bar greater than or equal to 200. Our alternative hypothesis or something that we believe is that the x bar is going to be less than 200. So it's important to note that the equal sign must be part of the null hypothesis. Thus, when comparing a sample mean to a population mean, the following are possible. The null hypothesis is x bar equals some mu or average. The alternative would be that x bar is not equal to mu. So here's an example. X bar equals 98.6 is the null hypothesis. X bar is not equal to 98.6 as the alternative hypothesis. This is a two-tailed test. Notice there was no greater than or less than symbol at all. Another example is where X bar is less than or equal to mu. The alternative hypothesis is that the X bar is greater than mu. Again, notice the equal sign is in the null hypothesis always. As an example, we have the x bar is less than or equal to 15 as the null hypothesis, and x bar greater than 15 as the alternative hypothesis. This is a one-tailed test. And we can flip this whole thing around where x bar is greater than or equal to mu. Therefore, the alternative hypothesis is that x bar is less than mu. So we write this down as x bar greater than or equal to 1024. That's our null hypothesis. x bar is less than 1024. That's our alternative hypothesis. This is also a one-tailed test. Now soon we're going to show how to conduct the statistical test for these hypotheses. Now consider the first example that we had where x bar is equal to 200, x bar is not equal to 200, as the null and alternative hypothesis respectively. The goal is to see if our sample was not equal to 200. The statistical test will provide evidence to either reject or not reject the null hypothesis. Remember that statistics is about probability, and therefore there exists a certain probability that the final result is incorrect. The goal is to minimize the chance of being wrong. So only two outcomes are going to be possible in any statistical test here. We either reject or we do not reject the null hypothesis. So notice two things, we have not accepted anything, nor have we really done anything with regards to the alternative hypothesis. So what's our procedure? So graphically, again, we have x bar is equal to 200 as the null hypothesis, x bar is not equal to 200 as the alternative hypothesis. And we have our population mean of 200, which looks like it's to the edge of the red confidence interval. Since the population mean is within the interval, there is no evidence to reject H0. Thus, we do not reject H0. We're going to show this later using another statistical test. I'm doing this graphically right now just to show you what's going on. If we change the null hypothesis to be that x bar is equal to 195, 
that technically moves the population mean outside of the boundary of that red confidence interval. And in this example, the population mean falling outside means that there exists evidence to reject H0, and thus we reject the null hypothesis. It is very important to note that one never accepts the null hypothesis or accepts the alternative hypothesis, nor is it said that H0 or HA is true. The assumption is that since there is always a chance that the analysis could be wrong due to statistical errors in the sample, the safest way to state the results is only we have evidence to reject H0 or we do not have evidence to reject H0. Even in the case when H0 is rejected, the notion that HA is accepted is not correct. However, it could be followed by we reject the null hypothesis and therefore we have evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. And the reason for this is the types of errors that we have. No matter how good statisticians are, <laughs> they cannot be perfect. There is always a chance for error. In hypothesis testing, there are two types of errors, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 errors occur when you reject the null hypothesis when we shouldn't have. This occurs when we have found evidence that the alternative hypothesis appears to be correct, but in reality it was wrong. Type 2 is not rejecting the null hypothesis when we should have. This occurs when our analysis did not provide evidence that we should have rejected the null hypothesis, but in reality that was wrong. And so a chart can be developed to identify these types of errors. So evidence to reject H0, but in reality H0 might be true, type 1 error, that's alpha. That's what we're looking for when we look for our alpha value. If we didn't have evidence to reject H0, and H0 was true, then our analysis worked. In the case where we have evidence to reject H0, but H0 is not true, then that too works. But in the final case where we had no evidence to reject H0, but in reality H0 was not true, that is what we call a type 2 error. So the errors center on the probability or the probability committing a type 1 or type 2 error. And type 1 error is really the first and most common review for a statistical test and the one that we will focus on. The probability of making a type 1 error is called the level of significance. This should be familiar since in prior modules, the significance level was discussed, and in the example cases, it was denoted by the level, by the letter alpha, and was generally set. In general, significance levels are set to 0 0.05 meaning there's a 5% chance of making a type 1 error. In the upcoming statistical tests, a probability of computing an error will be conducted, denoted by what we call the letter P or p-value. This shouldn't be confused with the proportions that we talked about in the previous module. And we're going to compare this p-value to the alpha. If the p-value is less than alpha, then we will reject the null hypothesis since the probability of that error is less than the probability of alpha, which is a type 1 error, 